Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ray Perman. I'm the director of the David Hume Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the latest of the seminars in our autumn program. Tonight, we're going to look at the internationalization of Scottish business. Successive Scottish governments have urged business to become more international, but it is uh, a problem that many companies never solve. However, we have one uh, outstanding industry which has been international for more than 100 years in the Scotch whisky industry. Um, if you looked at that objectively, you would say, why can that be the case? This is a product which is made in one small nation on the corner of Europe, uh, but has managed to uh, get its product into practically every market in the world. And uh, it's interesting to wonder why that has happened. So that is the issue that we set this evening's speaker, uh, Alf Young, to look at the internationalization and the export performance of Scottish industry generally, but then to look at those characteristics of the Scotch whisky industry and to say, are there lessons there which can be extracted and learned by other industries? Are there special uh, some circumstances that could be replicated or not? So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Alf. Uh, he has written a very full paper, which is available for download on the David Hume website, uh, but he will be giving a summary of, summary of that this evening. And then I'll hand over to uh, David Frost, who is chief executive of the Scotch Whiskey Association. We're very pleased to have them as sponsors <coughs> this evening and sponsoring the paper from Alf. Uh, and David will chair the discussion after that. So. Now, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Alf Young. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ray. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I would start uh, with a wee icebreaker, so if you give me just a second. I'm just going to put a couple, a couple of bottles. I was in a cupboard at home. Uh, and, and found a couple of uh, things that I thought were relevant uh, to this evening. Uh, you may be sitting there wondering why does this man think he knows anything about the Scotch whisky industry? Well, I've been in and out of looking at the Scotch whisky industry for what seems like an eternity. Um, the first uh, time I went on a trade mission was, I think, in 1982. Uh, and uh, it, it was all down to Ray Perman, actually, because uh, he uh, was involved in the startup of a new paper called the Sunday Standard, and uh, he couldn't find a, a Labour correspondent uh, to join the team, I think, within weeks of launch. Uh, and they looked around and found this guy who had once been a teacher, had then uh, worked briefly in politics in the late 70s, uh, and was lang languishing uh, as a news reporter at Radio Clyde, uh, and I got a job. And within a year of getting the job, I was on a plane to Mexico City with a Scottish Council trade mission. Uh, and as my memory serves me, and I'm getting on a bit, so the memory may be somewhat uh, uh, out of kilter, but on that uh, trip to Mexico City, I think there were five members of the Scotch whisky industry, all selling to Mexico. Uh, it seemed to me as a kind of novice, because it was rather odd that all five of them came from the same company, but representing different brands. Uh, and of course, the company was distillers. Uh, so there was someone there for Johnny Walker, there was someone there for Black and White, and so on, uh, all going out there to fight with one another to sell whisky. Uh, to the Mexicans. Um, and of course, within three years of that uh, experience, I was plunged into the great takeover battles of the mid-1980s. And this bottle you won't see very many places because that bottle, those of you who were with better eyesight than I, will see that it's actually called Old Acrimony. And it's old acrimony because it was given to me by Sir Alistair Grant, who I think was a fellow of this uh, institution, uh, but was also 
in his time, first uh, the right-hand man to Jimmy Gulliver in the Argyle group in the days of the takeover of Bells by Guinness and then the great battle between Argyle and Guinness for control of that same company I'd encountered on the flight to Mexico, the Distillers Company. Uh, and um, that was an extraordinary episode. I think I, I didn't write a story about anything else for all of 18 months. Uh, first, the Bell story, which I only got because I was the only person in the Scotsman office at the time when the text came through. I think it was a telex in those days, came through uh, that Guinness had launched the bid for Bells uh, when its then uh, managing director was stranded in Chicago. And we're talking pre-digital era then, so it was quite difficult. But by the time we got to the distillers battle, it, it became really quite an unpleasant affair, hence uh, the, name, the name on the bottle, uh, Old Acrimony. Uh, it's also, it, it, says that, that the, uh, it says that the two, um, dis, this, this, the distillers, I need, sorry, I need to put my glasses on to see the print. Uh, the two, um, the distillers were Grant and Webster and Company. Uh, of course, uh, Grant was Alistair Grant. Webster was David Webster, who was uh, Jimmy Gulliver's uh, finance director. Uh, and the acrimony was just the memory of being so near but so far in terms of taking over uh, the business. You'll see that a little bit out of the bottle. I think I drank uh, um, a couple of halves out of the bottle uh, in 2001 when Alistair sadly died much younger than he should have been going to his maker, but uh, um, you'll notice I haven't drunk the rest of it. Uh, so it's now, I guess, 30 years old, uh, and there's still quite a lot in there. The other is a rather different, uh, it's a smaller bottle. It's not even Scotch, it's Japanese. And uh, I was in another trade mission in Japan in the 90s, and uh, I went to see a Japanese distillery in the, the Alps south of uh, uh, Tokyo, a Hakushu distillery, one of the Suntory distilleries. And of course, Suntory had an interest in Scotch whisky as well because they, uh, by then, were close to owning uh, Morrison Beaumont on Isla. Um, and I went to Hakushu and I was taken round by the, the head distiller and the head distiller uh, was a graduate of Heriot Watt University, the School of Brewing and Distilling. Uh, the distillery was an almost exact copy, had it been in Scotland, of what it would have been had it been in Scotland. The stills, the copper stills were fabricated and pressed in pans. The peat was imported from uh, Inverness by ship. Uh, the only thing that was Japanese in the makeup of the whisky was the water coming off the hills behind the distillery. Uh, and when he gave me this bottle at the end of the tour, uh, he said to me, young son, he said, I want you to have this. My blood is in that bottle. Uh, you'll notice I haven't even broken the seal on that one. Because <laughs> uh, 20 odd years on, I can't really think of what's the right time uh, to do that. I thought of doing it last year when I turned 70 and we had a family party down in, uh, in Wiltshire, but uh, I didn't, I resisted, so I'm still looking for an excuse to do that. You can see in all of this, ladies and gentlemen, that I am not um, such a heavy consumer of the whiskey that comes my way, that uh, I'm a problem in terms of the government's minimum unit pricing policy or any other attempt uh, to uh, reduce drinking in Scotland. Anyway, that, enough of the nonsense. Um, Internationalising uh, Scottish business, what lessons can we learn uh, from the whisky industry? Well, of course, you'll all know that the, the challenge to internationalise has become rather more strident in the last few years since the great fin financial and banking crisis of late, of 2007, uh, 2008. Uh, the prescription that seems to have emerged everywhere and on every political uh, set of lips, is, is to say what we have to do is get away from the intensive uh, um, 
the intensive uh, need to, ever to have ever more debt uh, uh, infested uh, consumption uh, and to move to an economy which trades more, sells more overseas and gets more overseas companies to invest here. That's been the prescription certainly uh, since uh, 2010 when the yet-to-be Chancellor George Osborne made his May lecture in London where he argued very strongly for that. It was the main prescription here in Scotland in 2011 uh, when the new uh, minority SNP government uh, issued its first trade and investment strategy in 2011 and very clearly of the view that because of the rather modest looking uh, growth forecast for the economy as was after uh, the uh, great crash, that there was a need to reinforce what Scotland had been trying to do for a very long time in terms of attracting foreign investment here, but also to export more to the rest of the world. That was the prescription. Uh, but whether that prescription has delivered I think is much more of an open question. Because I think when you look at the evidence for what's happened to trade uh, in general, uh, both from Scotland and from the UK as a whole since then, I think you find that the evidence is not actually there to say that we are actually turning that ambition, that political ambition, to rebalance the economy in favour of trade and exports that we're actually delivering in terms of the numbers. The problem with the numbers, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, is that they're not very reliable or very good. Uh, we get monthly UK trade figures uh, for the UK as a whole, but sadly, because of mistakes that have been made in them in the last uh, year, uh, the UK trade figures currently don't even qualify for uh, the national statistics kite mark uh, of reliability. Uh, the statistics authority in the UK took, they're rather unusual, they don't do it very often, but they stepped in and said, until you get these figures sorted out, we are going uh, to withdraw your kite mark. So you get that every month. You also get from HMRC, who see, presumably see all the transactions and therefore have a more robust database against which to, to judge these things, you get monthly trade figures from them too. The problem with them is that they are only figures on trade in goods. They don't, ha don't say anything uh, about uh, trade in services, which has been a growing feature of the overall trade picture in recent years. Indeed, if we didn't have something, I think it's somewhere of the order of seven or eight billion a month of, of trade in services in the UK as a whole. The deficit we have overall, which is caused by our continued appetite for foreign produced goods for consumption purposes, the overall deficit would be even larger than the two or three billion a, a month that it currently is. Um, but they're not covered by the HMRC figures. Rather more helpfully, from a Scottish point of view, the HMRC do a quarterly regional breakdown of their figures. The most recent one was for the second quarter of this year, came out in, in, in August, uh, and covered, uh, covered uh, the, the second quarter to June. Uh, and it does do uh, an analysis of uh, the figures for Scotland and where they're heading. But again, only for goods. And finally, in Scotland itself, we have a different uh, kind of statistic uh, called the Global Connections Survey, which is an annual survey of uh, a sample of Scottish companies uh, who respond to a questionnaire, which I've spent a bit of time when I was preparing this, actually going through things like the questionnaire to see what people are actually asked and, how, and in what form. Uh, these questionnaires go out once uh, for every year at the, uh, in the year that follows the end of that year. They're then processed, but it takes a year to process them. 
So you find out, for example, 2013's numbers uh, at the beginning of 2015. That's the most recent data we have because the, the events took place in 2013, the processing took all of 2014, and it's published in January of 2015. The next one, which will cover 2014, won't be published until next January in 2016. Um, it, it's got the advantage over the other uh, survey of uh, the HMRC that it does cover both goods, trade in goods and trade in services, but it has, I think, also uh, some disadvantages. Uh, because it's uh, being delivered on a sample that is really quite small and is actually shrinking. I think when they started doing it, and it, was, it predated the current government. It was introduced in 2002 uh, by the then Labour Liberal Democrat coalition. Um, it delivers um, numbers that uh, on a, a sample, which I think back then were, was about 10,000 companies. It's now down nearer 6,000. And the response rate is becoming smaller and smaller. I, I, I found, I managed to find, uh, although I, had, I don't know the numbers for 2014, which we'll see in January, but the sample uh, size that they're expecting to be working on is 1,600 companies. Now, that be, may be no bad thing, because one of the really uh, alarming things about the, the figures uh, for Scotland, as devised by, uh, as divined by the... Uh, the Global Connections Survey, is that um, they only do six, well, next year we'll only be doing 1,600 companies, but um, they uh, said in their most recent one for 2013, and this is a sentence that astonished me, uh, the concentration of international exports is skewed to around 30% of the international exports attribute, uh, is skewed with around 30% of the international exports attributable to around 10 businesses. 50% are attributable to around 50 businesses and 60% are uh, attributable to around 100 businesses. So it's a tiny sample and a tiny number of companies uh, that are coming up with most of the numbers um, and it's done on the basis of a voluntary survey sample where people are basically asked how much, do you, how much of your goods do you sell or, or services do you sell in the rest of the UK, in Europe and beyond Europe. Um, and the numbers, uh, I think, are A, based on quite a small sample, B, uh, regularly uh, changed as most statistics are, I mean, every, every statistic governments produced are revised and readjusted with time. But I don't know when you get a sample of companies telling you what they've sold, on what basis you then revise that, unless you're revising it because, because it doesn't match against other uh, data from other sources. But according to uh, the, uh, the Scottish Government survey, the figures uh, for Scotland are still on the way up and where but that's only up to 2013. The figures uh, coming from uh, the HMRC, the regional figures from the HMRC, which are up to date till June of this year, are much more depressing. Uh, they say in their most recent report that in the last six quarters in Scotland, uh, the number, the, the value of uh, goods, and it's only goods in their case, the value of goods being exported has been below the value of the same quarter the previous year. So for six, last six quarters in a row, the numbers have been going down. Uh, and we know from other bits of sectoral sources, uh, David's organization do an annual analysis of Scotch whiskey, and their numbers uh, for 2014, the most recent numbers for the year 2014, showed that there had been a a, a flattening off in uh, exports in 2013 and a fall of over 7% in 2014. So all the signs are that the numbers from the data, and I, I stress the data 
none of it. One's, one, one's lost its national statistics, Kite Mark, another only does goods uh, and deals on, on, on customs and other data that, that lies behind them. And then the Scottish survey, none of them seem to tell us a clear picture, but the most up-to-date ones are suggesting that despite the fact that politicians are saying we must drive the exports on, they're actually going in the opposite direction. Um, and that's left us continually with a, a trade deficit. We've had a, a trade deficit every uh, month for the last two years. It's helped by the growing trade in services, but the trade uh, uh, balance in goods is in the negative and continue, continues to be in the negative. Some of the, the fall-offs in Scotland identified by the HMRC data is really quite alarming. Uh, in this most recent report, uh, they, they reported that Scottish exports of goods to the EU were falling faster by 10% on the year than the, in, the rest of, in the UK as a whole. They were down in Germany by 21%, down in Belgium by 19%. <laughs> exports to the USA, which are our biggest market, uh, had fallen uh, by nearly 5%. And these were falls that were coming despite the fact that the HMRC was finding that more Scottish companies were uh, registering as exporters who were actually exporting from, from the country. It leaves Scotland, with, in terms of goods, uh, with a share of UK exports of 7%, uh, which is certainly lower than the southeast of England and London, as you would expect, being, if, if you look at... Um, uh, the exports overall, the biggest player, but it means that Scotland is lagging places, uh, regions of England like the North East, sorry, the North West, the West Midlands, and the East of England. Uh, so we have a picture that doesn't match with the exhortations uh, from government at both the Scottish level uh, and at a London level to export more. There was a related uh, feature to this whole drive which suggested that we should, uh, apart from exporting more, that we should revive manufacturing. Some of you will remember uh, George Osborne's two, 2012 budget speech where he talked about uh, renewing the march of the makers. Um, I suppose in the week that uh, the last remnants of the Scottish steel industry and the steel industry in Teesside are beginning to hit the wall, uh, and in the wake of other things like the paper mill in Fife, which is probably the last major paper mill in Scotland going, that the march of the makers in terms of political rhetoric and on the ground reality is rather different. Uh, indeed, uh, in terms of employment in manufacturing, I think it's fair to say that on all the employment data, uh, manufacturing as a share of total employment in the UK is now below 10% for the first time. It's down about 9.7%. Uh, um, so we have a rather strange uh, mismatch between the rhetoric of what has to be done if we are not to go through more turbulence like we experienced in 2007-08 uh, and what is actually being done. And yet within this, as Ray said at the outset, we've got this strange phenomenon that the, the Scotch whisky industry has managed from 2004, I think, to, in the decade from 2004, managed to increase its uh, exports of whisky in total by over 70% and its exports of single malts by more like 160%. These, the, these are remarkable achievements in the period that included the crash. Not just that, but we've got, uh, I remember the time I was in Japan, for example, uh, people were bemoaning the fact that more and more Scottish distilleries were going into mothball, that the industry had produced far too much spirit, uh, the market wasn't there for it, and there was a real sense of retrenchment uh, and uh, pulling back. The story now is quite remarkable. There were, I think, six new distilleries last year, there are another 40 projects, large and small, in various stages of planning and development. And although one or two of them, like the expansions 
at Diageo have been put off for a year to see what the climate looks like then, um, there's a real appetite in lots of places to produce more. And this is, let's think about it, this is an industry, doesn't employ huge numbers of people, about 10,000 directly and another 40,000 in associated jobs across the UK as a whole. But this is an industry typically to be found in small rural communities, in remote parts of Scotland. And it's an industry that is doing something that's rather against the grain of modern times. You make your spirit, you distill your spirit, and then you decide to leave it in a shed for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and then you look for someone to sell it to. That's got a kind of timeline perspective that I, uh, I think I suggested in the paper. It's kind of like the, the Mackers uh, perspective uh, that might match what, the way Warren Buffett in Nebraska goes about investing in equity markets. That it's got a time scale that is utterly out of uh, sync with the modern world. And yet out of an industry that invests so far in advance of reaping the rewards, that, that industry is thriving and developing. And I think a bit of why it's thriving and developing is because of these two things I showed you at the beginning. Somehow, the people in that industry have invested into it, not just uh, some alcohol distilled in a very interesting way with a, 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 a quite uh, uh, interesting taste that lots of people get quite fond of, uh, but they've, they've invested in it something more than that. So that if you uh, go on to McTeer's website in Glasgow and look at the the monthly uh, whiskey uh, um, auction, you'll see bottles like, I mean, I, I suppose I could make a bit of money and put these, uh, well, not the, other, not the one I've had a couple of sips out of, but um, there, there is a market there where value is added beyond the basic process of making the whiskey and then developing it. It really is quite an exceptional craft, and it's one that has one worldwide appeal. 200 markets around the world, I think, where Scotch whisky is sold. And of course, also in Japan and in other places, people who are desperately trying uh, to make it too and see if they can make it, despite the fact it's not in Scotland and it essentially isn't capable of being called Scotch whisky. So that's part of it. It's, it. it's a kind of sense of long-termism. And I think it's bred into the people who work in that industry. And so... A lot of the people who are involved in these new whiskey expansions, investing in new distilleries or uh, taking an old distillery and bringing it back to life, because that's what's happening to a lot of the ones that were mothballed in the 80s and 90s, uh, it's because they've all always had that perspective that you're doing this not for tomorrow or not for next week or not to meet a target, but to do it for a much longer term. And that rather contrasts with... Um, the governments, because we, we talked a bit about the numbers and how hard it was to, to see them. But the governments, both in Edinburgh and London, both thought it wise to set targets for this export drive that they were going to deliver on. In Scotland, uh, they decided uh, at, at the time of the, the launch of the export and investment strategy that, that Scottish exports should grow by 50% between uh, 2010 and 2017. Um, they're nowhere near getting to 50% growth on the numbers that I've seen. I think the chances of them doing so are really very, very remote. And George Osborne, uh, not to be bettered, uh, announced, I think, in 2012 that he wanted to see uh, a trillion pounds worth of UK exports by 2020. At the time, UK exports were standing somewhere, somewhere north of 300 million. So it was a more than tripling uh, of the 2012 number by 2020. On the evidence of what's been uh, achieved so far, uh, I think almost everyone from the British Chambers of Commerce uh, to all sorts of other analysts have said, you have no chance of getting uh, to a trillion 
by 2020. Uh, on the numbers so far, I think the Royal Bank just recently did a, a note on uh, the prospects for the, that target being met and said that uh, if they go at the rate they've been going up to in 2014-15, uh, they will have to go 10 times faster in the re years remaining to 2020 to get to a trillion. So they've set the targets. The targets aren't going to be met. We've got rather uh, mixed messages from the different uh, sets of numbers. Um, and there in front of their eyes is an industry that's working in much longer horizons and is actually doing the kind of rate of or we're certainly doing it up until 2013, uh, doing the kind of rate of expansion in exports that most of the rest of the economy isn't managing. I think there are other reasons why uh, the uh, Scotch whisky industry has been successful in this. The, go back to my image of five distillers, uh, salesmen, sitting in a plane, all going to the same market and all competing with each other to sell uh, the brand. I think there is invested in the whole industry, not just a long-termism, but a determination to protect the product. And that's vitally important in any kind of attempt to grow exports in other parts of the world. Um, just in the, the last uh, few days and weeks, uh, uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association has won a case in China against a rogue uh, producer of bottle closures who was putting Scotch whisky on them and then sending the, the local hooch with the Scotch whisky label uh, on, the, on the closure uh, to Myanmar for sale. And they won a, a court case in China where the Chinese are going to enforce uh, action on that. Just recently, again, uh, they have uh, managed to sign an agreement that Scotch in terms of world trade jargon, uh, has a unique identification as something that was distilled for at least three years in Scotland. And that's now being accepted in a whole group of Central African republics um, uh, due to an agreement there. And I think it also knows incredibly well, as I've found in trade missions I've been on from Mexico to Russia, uh, to parts of Europe, to uh, Japan, I, I've discovered that they also work incredibly well with the infrastructure of government on the ground in these places. So we've got, we've got uh, people who can work with government to enforce stronger action where uh, the rules are being broken. They've got people with a sense of long-term perspective. Uh, and they've got a people with a shared, send, shared sense of purpose. Whether that shared sense of purpose is viable longer term, I think really depends on how governments, uh, having said they want this rebalancing, having set their targets, and now looking as if they're going to fail to deliver on those targets, how they now respond. We don't know how uh, the Scottish government will respond. We know they're about to produce a new strategy post-2015 for trade and investment. But we won't know whether their target for 2017 has been met and for quite some time yet. Um, in fact, we won't know that particular target has been met until January 2019, which is an awful long time away. Um, but we do know that George Osborne seems to be shifting his ground because in the July budget this year, uh, he seemed to have decided that the march of the makers and the trillion pound target for exporting uh, were becoming rather too burdensome in terms of delivery. So he's now decided that the really important thing is productivity. But of course, the other really important thing is to cut government uh, expenditure down to size. And we're going to see next month in the, the spending review just the, the next stages of that. But it's already clear from what was said at the budget time in a separate paper about all these new plans that he's looking to do something else with the delivery mechanisms of government. At the moment, we have in Scotland, Scottish Development International, which is it's the new version post-2001, I think it was, of Locate in Scotland. So it has the 
inward investment function, but it also has the trade function. And in the UK as a whole, we have UKTI, UK Trade and Invest, which currently sits as a unit within the Business Innovation and Skills Department in Whitehall. But it's clear from what's already been said post-budget in the published documentation that UKTI is going to be radically reorganised Instead of being a hub within business and skills, which is one of the prime departments for further government cuts, it looks as if the staff there, or some of the staff there, are now going to be seeded into individual departments in Whitehall. What that means for the UKTI staff in Scotland, I don't think anyone knows. But there's a radical shake-up going on. But it's a shake-up that is almost uh, as ill-judged as the targets were, and as some of the earlier uh, attempts at measuring uh, what the actual problem was were. Because it seems, to, it seems to me that the easiest way for governments to get behind uh, more exporting from business is to work with them and, and work with them through which what Brian Wilson, former Labour Minister, uh, and an exporter in his own right uh, to the... Uh, uh, th through the Harris Tweed industry, uh, was saying recently in a paper he was commissioned to do by the Scotland office in the heat of the referendum campaign. And he talked there of the need for a single portal. Some might call it a UK trade ministry. Some might call it something else. But a door that people can go through and think they'll get help if they want to export. That's a very long way from where we are at the moment with this different kinds of bodies in different places doing different things. So it looks to me that there's a, a need there for a much simpler rethinking. And that's not what we're going to get if we're going to get a partial breakup of UK TI and parts of it being seeded in, in other places. I'm not sure that everything that uh, the Scotch whisky industry can do, other industries can also do. But I think there are lessons there. I mean, if people have been down the track and have achieved uh, the levels of uh, success that they have, there must be scope somehow to take these lessons and transfer the knowledge into other sectors. There still clearly are sectors in the food and drink sector uh, out with Scotch whisky where that could be useful. You've got the resurgence of microbrewing. I mean, I. I still go to Aloha occasionally to see my football team, and I go in and see that every brewing site is now a supermarket. Uh, but even Aloha now has some successful microbrewers, and in the northeast we've got people like Brewdog and others making a bit of a stir. Uh, and that's true of the whole country, and there's an, uh, an obvious example. But of course that runs in, and I'm conscious throughout this talk that it always runs in, to other preoccupations of government, notably abuse of alcohol and health care uh, and the consequences. And, and that's a whole other topic, but I can talk to you about that a bit more in, in the question and answer if, if, you, if you wish. But there are areas, I think, even beyond uh, food and drink where the experience of protecting your property, of investing it with qualities and expectations and aspirations that are way beyond what's actually in the bottle that could be usefully learned uh, from a case-hardened uh, uh, group of people within the Scotch whisky industry have done it and experienced it and could pass that uh, message on. At the moment, in terms of how uh, the policy is being mediated by government, I just don't see that happening. But I, I would like to think that once it's admitted that the old targets have not been delivered, we might actually uh, get to the stage of of talking seriously about that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Al, for such an interesting paper and um, interesting talk. Um, as um, Ray said, I'm David Frost, a lucky person to be CEO of the Scotch Whiskey Association, which I've been for the last two years. 
Before that, I was uh, a diplomat, so most of my life as a diplomat, and spent much of that time doing um, trade, investment, exports work. So um, the professional interest I have in that now, I've brought with me from, from the past. Um, and with that in mind, um, I'm going to sort of slightly abuse my position as um, uh, sort of master of ceremonies and just make three very quick remarks stimulated by, by Alf's uh, presentation. Um, uh, just very quickly, first, first thing that strikes me is that if there's an export problem, it's a UK problem, it isn't just a Scotland problem. Scotland issue is a subset of the UK's general uh, inability to export over over recent years and I suppose there's a kind of question as to why one of the most open economies in the world seems so poor at, uh, at exporting um, and I think to me uh, there one of the reasons is that we are kind of sort of miscounting slightly in the sense that we're a big services economy the UK you deliver a lot of services by investing overseas delivering overseas and then the, the money comes back through interest, through dividends, through other kinds of remittances. And they don't show up uh, as exports. They show up in other bits of the, the current account. And, of course, one of the problems we've had in recent years is that bit of the current account has, uh, has got a lot less profitable than it, than it used to. Um, so I think, you know, if you're an economy that makes a lot of stuff and sends it overseas, you're going to have a different looking current account to one that invests overseas and delivers it that way. But it doesn't mean you're less international and it doesn't mean you're less, less focused. So I think there is a bit of miscounting going on, if you like, there. Second uh, observation on, on Scotland, um, picking up a bit of what Alf said. Again, I think there's a bit of... A sort of mi miscounting or misinterpreting, perhaps, what's going on uh, in Scotland. Um, there are two reasons why exporting is, is good, is thought to be good. One is the, the kind of obvious one, if, that you earn foreign currency by doing it. The second is the less obvious one, that companies improve their productivity when they export. And there's evidence that when you get your first export order, productivity goes up by about 40% because you're forced to meet standards, you're forced to organise yourselves in particular ways, and that gives a, a big payoff. Now, obviously, you only get the foreign currency if you do direct exports, as we do in Scotch whisky. Um, but you get the productivity improvements if you're part of a supply chain that ends up in exporting. And I think a lot of... I suspect they've got no actual evidence for it. I don't think you can get it from the figures. The One of the reasons why Scotland looks a bit less international in its exports is that quite a lot of what Scotland produces is part of a supply chain that goes through England and is then exported somewhere else. So you're still getting the productivity benefits, you're still forced to produce to those candidates, but it doesn't show up as part of the current account. So again, I think maybe there's some uh, difficulty in misinterpreting the figures that way, and we shouldn't be quite so gloomy about Scotland's performance as, as sometimes I hear people saying. Final quick remark um, on Scotch whisky itself. Um, Alfie touched on some of the lessons that, that can be learned. I think um, I will just pick out a couple of ways that Scotch is different and a couple that we are, uh, I think we do have lessons to learn. Why we're different? One, we are quite unusual in being a product made almost out of nothing, if you like, out of agriculture and water and, and yeast uh, and casks with a very limited upstream supply chain and then a product that's sent directly overseas. And actually in modern trade, that's, that's quite unusual. Most, most products aren't quite like that and have a different set of challenges. Second, and we, we really benefit from this, is having to take a long-term view. It's obviously inherent in the nature of the industry that you have to think long-term. You're producing now for sale in, in many years' time, and that forces you to take a different perspective, invest in markets overseas, not necessarily knowing how they're going to be in a few years' time, making that bet, but still thinking it's worth it. And I think that's an attitude that comes naturally to us, but actually could be quite good for... Uh, a lot of the rest of, of UK industry. Where could others learn? Just very quickly, one, 
protection of the GI, protection of the reputation, protection of the internet, intellectual property, that's been absolutely key for us, and uh, I'll you highlight that in the paper. Second, the other thing you highlight, and I'll finish there, is a um, very close relationship with government. You know, we really work on that. Uh, we're not looking for favours from government, but we're looking for a relationship with government overseas that enables them to know what's important to us, <laughs> to help us knock over trade barriers and to be present in markets. And that's not just UK government, that's EU Commission, that's WTO, it's all systems that, that go with that. And the more other industries, other companies are able to do that, so I think the more successful they'll be going forward as well. So that's my sort of two penny worth uh, stimulated uh, as you were talking, Alf. And uh, the floor is now open for, for questions. And we've got um, sort of half an hour or so, maybe a, a bit more if there's, uh, if there's lots of interest. So the floor is open. And do introduce yourself, please. Um, uh, I, know, I know a lot of people here, and you all know each other, but not everyone will know everyone. So do introduce yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, back there. Um, Crawford Gillis, uh, is this on? Uh, it Crawford is. Gillis, Scottish Enterprise. Oh, thanks for that. I think that was a very stimulating talk on what I think is a really, really important uh, topic. One thought and then a question. Um, my thought is um, we shouldn't underestimate the impact that Scotch has more broadly than just the direct impact because it really does contribute to the Scottish brand overseas. I know I was in India recently with some salmon producers and the Indians were positively disposed towards Scottish salmon because they'd all tried scotch. So because of the quality, the provenance, etc., cetera, it, it creates uh, an aura, which I think is uh, incredibly important. Uh, my thought is triggered by your, your point about uh, an international mindset, which this industry has undoubtedly had. It seems to me that we need to find ways to inculcate that more broadly in Scotland. And part of the issue is we need to broaden the question from just internationalizing Scottish business to internationalizing Scotland. Because I think one of the challenges is we, in many respects, we're quite a parochial, inward-looking nation, if I can put it that way. Uh, many indicators of, our, of the extent to which Scotland is international uh, are not very good at all. And um, I think we need to find ways to internationalize our entire society. I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts on that. Uh, I, think, um, I think my first thought is, um, if you're right, and I'm, I'm still pondering whether we have that uh, less than exemplary uh, international outlook. But certainly historically, it's not true. Uh, I mean, historically, there's plenty of evidence of Scots in all sorts of walks of life uh, uh, going all over the world. I mean, I, I think I discovered when I went to Finland that, the, that there's a major department store there called Finlayson, which was started by a Scot. And you can tell stories like that f all over the place. Uh, but there, there is a sense, I suspect, and this, this will go down not very well with those who are actively engaged on either side of the constitutional debate. I think we've maybe become so obsessed with ourselves and our relations with our immediate neighbours that the wider world has kind of fallen off the edges of the stage in recent years and, and made it more difficult to, to have that perspective. I mean, I just take an example, Crawford. I mean, uh, through Scottish Development International, you, you do the, the global uh, uh, survey uh, that gives us the Scottish figures, uh, such as they, they are. Uh, they've, always that, they've always asked throughout, where do you sell to? Outside Scotland, in the rest of the UK, in the rest of the EU, and beyond that, in the rest of the world. I think around 2009, 2010, we started talking not about uh, the bit that is sold in the rest of the UK as being trade within the UK common market, but as being exports. And that seemed to me to be part of the, simply part of the great yes, no debate that culminated in a referendum. So I think, I think we've begun to think of trying to position ourselves, are we part of the UK or are we not, has, has rather skewed our perspective on an awful lot of things, 
uh, including, I think, your point uh, about uh, how we've kind of lost sight of uh, an internationalism that certainly was very powerful in the 18th century and the 19th century. Great. Others may, may want to comment on that proposition, I guess, in questions, so feel free. But yes, down at the front here. Yeah. Uh, Hector McQueen, Professor of Law at Edinburgh University, with an interest in intellectual property uh, and a connection um, with the Scotch Whiskey Association, which has gone a little bit cold more recently, not because of any mutual ill will, but simply because my own research interests have moved on a little. But one of the things that's always struck me about the Scotch Whiskey Association is that it is, in some sense, a collective mm. of the industry. And in its origins, I think... This is part of my question, I guess. Uh, in its origins, it was a conglomeration or an association of a lot of small businesses which happened to be uh, working in the same area. That's obviously become considerably less uh, over, over time. But I wondered if there was something there that is part of the success. And, and David, in particular, in his remarks, commented on the ability of the Scotch Whiskey Association as such to link into government, for example, to express the interests of the industry in the widest sense. And Alf mentioned the, the five uh, folk from the distillers group who were all going to end up competing with each other because they had different brands, presumably, under their mm. uh, wings. Um, and I was just trying to think how this sort of history of the SWA uh, could apply in other areas of business where, as it were, the present state of play is lots of small businesses, um, which by and large would find it extremely difficult to do the sorts of things that David does, yep. and uh, whether there's anything at all to be said for, as it were, joint uh, activity of the kind that the SWA carries out, including perhaps the monitoring of disputes like the ones about single malts and so on. Uh, double malts and all the rest of it a few years ago with Cardew and others. I think in terms of small and medium businesses, I mean, they are now by far, you know, just in terms of number, the dominant force. And, and there you find, I think, from lots of experience of having tried to work with them, that the organisations that represent th them, like the form of private business or the Small Business Federation or whatever, is they are so diverse in what these businesses do, from one man and one woman bands to really quite substantial small businesses that are doing a lot of outreach. I mean, I remember once going to see a guy uh, before I went to a Japanese trip in the, in the Ojos who had a little textile mill and he was doing knitwear. This is long before we lost our textile industry. Uh, but he handed me his card and it was in Japanese with a picture of himself. Uh, and, and, you know, how he had learned somewhere in the mid-80s or late 80s to do all of that. I don't know, I, said, I don't think he would have got it from his local FSB officer uh, or, or, or anyone else. Somehow he had picked that kind of thing up. Uh, so I, I think it's hard to do it there. It's certainly easier in bigger areas like chemical products or some of the big, or, or, or the Scottish engineering uh, 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 federation, is it called Federation? I'm, I'm, I'm rusty on these things. It's, what's the Scottish, Scottish Engineering? I think it's just what it's called. I mean, the, the, they, they can do some of what the SWA does, but it's not just because they're he here and they've sponsored uh, this evening that I'm saying this, but I mean, the, the, I think you were, Hector, got it almost, you know, by saying it, it's not just a trade association, it, it, it's a community of interest that knows that although they're all selling against each other uh, and looking for markets, they've also got a common interest around a common, uh, a common brand in the lowercase sense that, that is denoted in all sorts of different multiple identities, whatever the distillery was, whatever kind of mix they do, whether they peat it or don't peat it, and so on and so on. But there's a basic powerful community of interest and a defensive force there that, that, that I think has run into the DNA now in a way that, from my experience of lots of other trade organisations, isn't quite there in them. Yeah, just, I mean, sort of, just, just to add a little bit to that, so I do think there's something in the history of the SWA that, you know, I feel 
quite strongly coming into it um, as a relative outsider that that is that is kind of special. You know, it's it's an old organisation. It's um, uh, it's its purposes have changed, but its sort of culture and history is still is still really strong. And I think, you know, as an as an organisation, as an industry, we have, if you like, two things which kind of force us down the direction we've taken. One that we've always been a strongly exporting industry. It's never been, you know, the figure has not necessarily been 90% that we export, but, you know, the industry has not always been viable unless exports have been viable, and it, that kind of forces you into it. The other, I think, is the, you know, the, the positive side of the coin of being a very highly regulated industry, one that depends for a lot of what it does on, you know, the warmth of government, the rules set by government, the attitude of government to, to an alcohol uh, industry and alcohol companies are very important and that forces you to interact with government it forces you to think about how government sees you and what are the relationships and again that's not necessarily true of uh, uh, of everything else so I think that kind of forces us and it isn't necessarily easy to replicate I, I mean I do see what seems to be happening with Scotland Food and Drink as an attempt to kind of go a bit in this same direction I think there's been some quite good successes within that but there's still a bit of a way to go and obviously there are different interests within that and never quite have the coherence of, of Scotch. Just, just one quote I, 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 I'm not sure it was always like that you know in the, in the days when I was going to Mexico with five different brand managers from five distillers companies I remember being in London at the end of the great distiller's saga when Guinness had won and uh, uh, the, the horrible grocer Gulliver had lost, um, being taken round one or two of the offices in London by someone from Guinness, uh, which were all very beautiful palatial townhouses. I think one was even the Queen Mother's family, uh, her own family's uh, townhouse in London, which had become one of the distiller brand's headquarters in London. Uh, and the stories that were being told back then, 30 years ago, was, was of you know, a rather patrician um, industry where the people who ran it uh, would come in on a Tuesday, have a good lunch, do 48 hours and go off on the Thursday afternoon back wherever they came and, and, and enjoy their very long weekend. Uh, and, and I think that's changed a lot. I mean, I, th I think, in a, in a, looking back re retrospectively, I, I think that was such a cathartic 18 months for the industry, you know, that, you know, this jumped up grocer was trying to take them over, or, and then when Ernest was discovered to be uh, uh, not quite uh, uh, kosher either, that, that, he, uh, that these, these people were taking over, but in a funny sort of way, it kind of shoved the industry into the modern world, uh, uh, and I think it in many ways made the SWA much stronger uh, as an organisation as I rem than as I remember it back then in the early 80s. More questions? Gosh, lots. So we take uh, a couple down here and then over there. Anne Packard, several of us in the room may be nearing our Zimmers in 20 years' time or a 30-year horizon. What, therefore, would be your best advice to people aged now 20 to 30 for their 20 and 30 year horizon. Gosh, and over there. Uh, Joe Armstrong. I, I'd like to pick up the point about the, the, the potential cartel and the uh, holding on to IP and to what extent actually what you're describing is trying to create barriers to entry or um, uh, limit uh, free competition. Uh, and whether, in fact, that's actually either allowable or um, replicable. Right. I'll start with the Zimmer question. Because um, <laughs> I think I'm not just approaching. I think I'm probably already there because I've got shingles at the moment. And um, I was hardly able to walk the last couple of weeks. Um, um, I've, got, I've got two sons, one 32 and one 28. Um, and I, I'm very loath to give them any advice. Uh, um, I've just I've just been reading what the IFS has been saying about uh, about my generation and how we got all the goodies and have left that generation with you know really quite a, a deficit. Uh, but I think what's exciting uh, about and it'll take me on to Joe's question uh, in a moment. Uh, I think what's quite exciting about 
scotch at the moment is that you know all sorts of interesting people are doing interesting things and they're not all big and you know looking to be a big player or, or, or build a big supply line i mean some of them are just doing it because they, they want to do it i mean I, I, i'm trying to remember his name mark rainier was it who bought um, uh, brook laddich uh, Brooke Laddick had been mothballed for a number of years and we were on holiday in Isla and, and went to see it and uh, were really quite taken by it, this kind of monument. Uh, but it had just been bought by this man, uh, uh, Mark uh, Rainier. Have I got, I got that? Um, and I, I knew a tiny bit about him because I knew that his sister and her French husband ran a very good uh, uh, restaurant in Assent. Uh, in the north side of Assen, uh, and um, one of my sons lives up in Ullapool, so that was quite important to me. Um, uh, but, you know, they took that over. They did some very uh, innovative things about packaging. They did things about teaching people about whiskey, and I put huge amounts of energy into that project. Uh, and then along came Ren Remy Martin, or one of the big, one of the big French uh, 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 spirit houses, uh, and paid him 10, 12 of a multiple of what he paid for Brooke Laddock in the first place. And as far as I know, he's now in Southern Ireland trying to do the same thing again uh, somewhere over there. Uh, so the, it, it, has, you know, it has some space opening up within it to do things differently. Uh, but in a wider context. Yeah, obvi obviously, obviously in a wider context. You know, I, I'm... I know it's something we should be spending so much more time doing um, uh, because it is much harder for that generation to get a start and, and there's a natural instinct to move to areas like IT and software and things like that. Um, I just wish we could find ways as a society to, to encourage more people who, you know, might want to make clothes, might want to do all sorts of things, uh, of finding new ways to do it that will fulfill their ambitions and also give them a living and might also, in the fullness of time, create an industry. But we don't, we don't seem to think... We, you know, we talk about apprenticeships, we talk about all sorts of other ways of, get, of solving the intergenerational crisis. Um, but we don't really have ways and means laid down to give my kids' generation. Uh, I've got one boy who's a gardener, uh, went to university and chucked it, and he's, he's a gardener in uh, Cornwall. And I've got another son who builds eco-housing with his father-in-law in, in Wester Ross. Uh, so, uh, and they're doing what they want to do. Uh, and it may become more than just something that pays the bills, and it may become a, a, a serious business. But I think we have to find ways of letting more young people live and breathe their ambitions. And, you know, I think that's a challenge for people like Crawford, um, to be honest. Uh, you know, we've got all these agencies that we spend quite significant sums of money through. But, you know, there is an intergenerational thing there that we, we, need, to, uh, we need to come up with fresh thinking about how you help that generation to be as creative as the grocers from the 19th century who started selling bottles of scotch from their, their shops in places like Kilmarnock or, or, or Aberdeen. Joe, um, I don't think... It, I, it's not restrictive in the sense that there's... I don't think there's anybody saying there's a closed shop in Scotland or we wouldn't have had six new distilleries in the last year. And, and you know, a number of them are quite small-scale. There's one in Arden and Merkin. Uh, there's one in Fife, there's one in uh, the west side of Harris. Um, it's not all uh, Diageo or one of the other big players saying, I, I mean, I know people from the big play. I, I was talking just the other week to an ex-finance director of one of the big players who was saying to me, if only we'd laid more, down more stock 15 years ago. You know, this is the long-term problem. They undercalled the market surge. Uh, and stock, in some ways, is a, 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 the kind of good stock is at a premium. Um, but it's not restrictive in that sense. It's not restrictive internationally in that my... I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the poor man's name from Japan. It was so long ago. 
uh, but uh, we've not stopped them. Now making whiskies, which uh, I mean, I think even uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association would accept. Some of them are of high quality and win international awards. Um, we haven't stopped people making whiskey in Ireland or America or lots of it. Not even Wales. There's a, there's a distillery in Wales, which I've passed not that long ago. Um, so it's not restrictive in that sense. But I think it is sometimes, uh, you know, I think that, you know, my 30 odd years of reporting business in Scotland, I spent far too long going to dinners where people patted each other on the back and awarded people gongs for this and gongs for that. And you met the same people several times in a, a season uh, at the same table talking about the same things. And I just think uh, this is a trade association that's not just doing that stuff. It's actually doing the important stuff of we've got something that's valuable that other people all over the world value too and are prepared to pay serious amounts of money for. Um, and really see, I mean, it never ceases to astonish me. One of my favourite whiskies is Mortlach. It's, it's a Diageo brand from Speyside. And I used to be able to buy it uh, for £40 a bottle, something like that. It was mainly a, f a filler for other blends. Uh, very rarely did they actually bottle it as a single malt. Uh, and just a few years ago, they decided it was actually worth doing it. And that's one of the big expansions that are in the pipeline, is an expansion at Mortlach. But they're now already selling it as a single malt. Uh, and I looked at, online at a, a whiskey site to see what it was, they were charging for it, and it was five ninety nine a bottle. Not, not five pounds 99, <laughs> 599 pounds a bottle for my beloved Mortlach. Uh, so I, I looked around and found a couple of bottles of uh, the old fruit and flowers version, which you could get for 45 quid. So I got two. <laughs> Just uh, maybe to, to add to the, the question about, um, you know, are we, are we protecting illegitimately something that, uh, that we shouldn't be? I, I, I think my answer to that is, uh, is, is twofold, really, and, and, and it's no, to be clear. Um, but the reason why, and I do ask myself that question as somebody who believes quite strongly in sort of free markets and competition and all of that, um, I think the reason it's legitimate is that you know, the sort of very obvious one is very easy to produce something that looks like Scotch whiskey but doesn't taste like it and isn't it but can easily be passed off as it. And unless you are protecting the production method and the way that goes with that and the costs and everything that's invested in maturation and so on, that will be very easy to do. And I think um, the ability to protect that methodology of the way we produce scotch in Scotland is a reasonable thing to do because it will be so easy to, to undermine it. The second reason, you know, is that there is plenty of competition in the system, as I've said. You know, there's, um, there's competition from uh, you know, within the UK, actually, but but um, other whiskies with slightly different business models, slightly different rules around the world, do bring innovation. Mm -hmm. They do uh, the the huge amount of foreign capital and investment that comes in Scotland also brings in new skills and new perspectives. So I'm, you know, I'm personally convinced that this is um, uh, an industry that does face pretty strong competitive forces, actually, and um, the ability to protect the production method if you like, and enforce it is a reasonable precondition for there being an industry at all to protect. And, and one last tiny bit. Uh, Thirty odd years ago, when all that mothballing was taking place and there was overcapacity and far too much whiskey for the market demand, of course, a lot of the big players shipped it out by the shipload uh, to be turned into whatever it was to be turned into in Japan or wherever else. Uh, so there was plenty of... Uh, of that going on then, and I think it's only once the industry realised that there was no point, you know, being a kind of mass production uh, spirit uh, pipeline to the rest of the world, uh, and actually started putting it into bottles that seemed to mean something to the people who were buying them, uh, that they actually took off in in market terms. As uh, as you know, I mean, they're, they're, whiskey's what a quarter of UK, UK. food. Food and drink uh, exports, it's, it's the best part of four billion uh, on the Scottish numbers. Uh, it's huge. And that's from, you know, places you pass on the way to Inverness 
sort of sitting in moorland. Uh, it's extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Let's take uh, two or three more questions. Go to the, the, the back now. Yeah, there. And then we'll do two more. My name is Richard Curley. Um, I holidayed in France last year in an area which in July and more so in August is swamped with wealthy Parisians and Bordelais. And I took our, our host or the owner of the property a bottle of good whiskey which I knew he liked, his wife liked. They were delighted. I bumped into him near the local supermarket, a Carrefour, and we were both shopping together, and we strolled around, and he said, this is my choice here, though he can go to other places quite readily. Um, and he pointed a couple, to a couple of good whiskeys, and then he said, I don't think I'll be buying that, because on the shelf below were a collection of bottles that had sort of Brigadoon SS politician labels on them. I checked. They were made by members of your organization. Is it easy to reconcile those two ends of the market in uh, um, different parts of the world, particularly those where you're seeking, presumably, to achieve the higher value end? Mm. No, it's a good, interesting question, but let's take a, a few more um, uh, down the front here, and then we'll take one more, um, perhaps there, yeah. Hi, it's Peter Rieke. Um, to maybe try and widen it a little bit uh, and at risk of intellectualizing, you seem to have achieved something in game theory about collaborating rather than competing and everyone finally recognizing that that's the right thing to do. It, may it be that, for example, the Scottish government's approach to diversity on boards and diversity more generally could be the best thing they would do for exports because in general, a more diverse board and a more diverse leadership will, I think the research shows, intend or be more likely to collaborate more than compete as traditional boards have tended to do. So maybe we're looking in the wrong area for the levers to pull to try and improve our international competitiveness and our export potential. Is that a, a reasonable argument to make? Interesting question. Um, and one more, yeah, that. Uh, Bill Roger, um, I, I guess my, I'm trying. I'm reacting a little bit to to your comment every now and then off about it being extraordinary that the this is coming from these little places near Inverness or whatever. Uh, I, I would suggest that that might actually just be the the magic ingredient, uh, the, the, and that's inextricably linked with the the idea of Scotland, the brand. There can't be much doubt, really, that the, the, the traumas of the 80s brought international marketing and international capital into Scotch whisky, the industry, but they then needed that magic ingredient in order to sell the proposition. And the, 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 so the, the question I'm left with is, is what scope in terms of internationalizing Scottish business there might be for uh, something which uses uh, Scotland, the image of Scotland as a brand to push the, the premium up on the products we're producing and not just ship stuff off and do it mass market uh, as we seem to do more and more of every year. Yeah. That's, that's a completely uninformed opinion rather than backed by fact, but I suspect it may be the case. Great. Now, right. We'll just start. Um, are you, you're going to take Richard's question, I take it. Oh, okay. Um, well, yes, let's do one more. Um, no, but you know his one about the... Oh, sorry, the yes. Um, I was letting you go first. All right, I see. Uh, yes. <laughs> You're putting it off Hello. then. I see, I see. <laughs> Peter, is it Peter Ricky? Um, I, I, I wasn't quite... You, you have to enlighten me. Uh, you, you said the government proposals about more diversity on boards. The government's uh, diversity and the general... But, but not, in, not in boards of businesses, is it? Is, it, is, it, is this not the bill for yeah. higher education? The business as well. Yes. But how are they going to enforce that? Well, I, I'm not sure that's the point. There must be. There, <laughs> Graham, somebody, the civil servants, they can tell us. What, what is the proposal? <laughs> I think there's a general encouragement of diversity in boards, both from the Scottish government and indeed from the UK government. Uh, and I think you know, even the IOD and the CBI... Yeah, are but, it, but it's not something that's no, necessarily enforceable. It's It's... Encouragement. Yeah. 50 50, but it's encouragement. 
Yeah. Whereas in universities, it's, a, it's rather more directed guidance. I haven't read that. Uh, no, no. I, I, th I mean, I, I certainly, from the older experience I, I was recounting about some of the old boards and, and, and the stuffiness of them, uh, that, you know, I think some of them have, have learned that. But, uh, I mean, the composition of boards after 30 years of writing about companies and their boards and the people on them remains a mystery to me, how people come to be on this board or that board. It's... Uh, it's a black art that uh, is, is beyond my ken. Um, if I may, sorry, it was a slightly wider question, but how, what are the other things that governments and others can do about strengthening our industries and helping them collaborate with each other to be able to export better, as opposed to just... Well, sort of on to, to go back to what I was saying, and there's more about it in the, in, in the paper, I think, I think for somebody in a sector with a limited amount of exposure to selling overseas. Um, I mean, I, I was always conscious that lots of Scottish businesses uh, and this um, selling uh, overseas was really to open a branch office in Newcastle. I mean, it's, I mean, even quite big Scottish house builders, you know, would balk at the idea that moving out of their Northeast Territory or their Central Belt Territory and actually go and build uh, houses anywhere in the north of England. Um, so there was, there was a reluctance there. But I, I think, I, th I think, I mean, it's a kind of right, really trite answer, but um, I think you need, uh, for people who are just taking the first steps on that pathway, to present them with something that is accessible. And I don't, I don't actually think the offering, uh, whether it's the Scottish Development International offering or the UKTI offering or the government exhortation in general, that it's necessarily very easy to navigate. I mean, Crawford's either um, better to answer this than I, but I mean, Scottish enterprise and Highlands and Islands enterprise, the dominant part of their work is to work through account managed companies. My question is, if there's, there's an awful lot of companies out there that aren't account managed by either of these organisations, or only, I think, 2,500 between them, or 2,700 between them, of all the other tens of thousands of companies in Scotland that might be thinking, could we, could we do some exporting? Where do we find the advice? The obvious big portal at the moment is either in Inverness at High or in the rest of Scotland in uh, Scottish Enterprise. And I'm not sure that, I may be wrong, Crawford, you may take everyone to your bosom as they knock the door, but I suspect the account managed system is a barrier to where all these other people are, only, are going to get, uh, Jeremy, who's also on the Scottish Enterprise board, is, not, is shaking his head, so. I'm in dangerous territory here. I, I should back off quickly. Uh, Move swiftly on to the, the other question. The other question was... was, uh, was, was, was the magic ingredient. The, yeah, the magic in ingredient. I, thi I think there is certainly truth in that. I, I, uh, I know someone who lets a, a little place in Fife out through Airbnb uh, that has a steady stream of people from all over the world coming here. And I sense from talking to her about the kind of people who come and the kind of things they ask, and they come from Australia, from uh, all over Europe, from Poland, from uh, Romania, all sorts of places. They, they are coming in search of a Scotland that I don't think is catered for by some of the familiar Scottish uh, Visit Scotland icons of why they come here. So it's not the tattoo and it's not shortbread and might not even be Scotch whiskey, but they come because there is something they're looking for. And I, I don't know how you capture that in a more effective way, but I, th I, think, I think the appeal, the appeal of Scotland is, you know, the appeal of whiskey is way beyond that hundred odd distilleries. The appeal of Scotland is way beyond uh, the five million people that are here. There is something that does have a, a resonance in the rest of the world, and you know, if we if, if we could bottle it, we would do much better uh, in terms of all the things that we're trying to do. Is that 
It's Peter, isn't it? Is it Peter? Bill, Bill Roger. I think most of us that live here uh, love the place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, uh, most of us don't really understand why, but it's to what extent that is transferable uh, uh, beyond the, the whiskey business? To what extent could that be developed as a, a, an ingredient that, uh, for, for other industries? I, I'm struggling to think of them, to be honest, other than tourism, uh, which of course is big enough. Uh, but that's, that's where I'm coming from. Is, is, is it a lost cause in, in most of the mundane manufacturing? Well, I, I come from Inverclyde. Um, how, how you get... Uh, well, I'm wrong, actually, uh, because Inverclyde... Uh, Greenock gets 43, 44 cruise ships a year. Uh, and, um, you know, if you go to Greenock, when a cruise ship's in, you'll see tens, not hundreds of crew people heading for the nearest Primark, coming back with bags on both hands. And you'll see a lot of people coming ashore and um, going and looking at things like the, the Free French Memorial on the hill and talking about war and what happened here and what happened there. You know, so there's all sorts of ways in which these appeals are. But pushing it beyond the visitor experience of a place that they long to come to see into something that is actually dynamic in business formation or new business formation is harder. It's not impossible, though, because, you know, there, there are little businesses springing up all over. I mean, I've been going to Ullapool for a long time now since my son fell in love with a girl from there and got married and now, now have our first grandchild. Uh, and if you look, you know, just in the arts in Ullapool, the number of galleries and mackers that are now set up around that tiny little village, um, 2,000 people. Uh, in the summer, it's heaving with people. And there's five art galleries in, in Argyle Street, um, in West Argyle Street. Um, and there are people beginning to venture into things like food, areas of food. And you know, it, it's, uh, I think it's encouraging. It's all so small scale and micro, and you think it's never going to mean tuppence in the, the bottom line of Scottish GDP, but it's a, it's a possibility. Mm. Interesting. Just let me quickly answer Richard's question, and then um, uh, we'll take one more round uh, quickly and then, then finish up. Um, I think my answer to your, to your question is, um, yes, you can do, do this. Um, and uh, I think for two reasons. One, um, as I was saying earlier, there's no such thing as low quality Scotch whisky. You know, you have to make it according to um, rigid standards. Uh, you have to make it here. You have to make it according to traditional methods and so on and so forth. You will, you will know that. Obviously, much of the cost of Scotch um, is in the working capital being tied up in maturation. So the longer you mature, by and large, the more expensive something will be. But it doesn't mean that... Um, uh, there, there is low quality Scotch whisky um, out there. The second, um, second reason I think is that you know, Scotch at relatively low price points in a lot of markets around the world is the bridge between the local spirit and the international spirit that, that Scotch. And though in, in many markets, you know, not particularly France, but many markets around the world, it's those that provide the entry, the aspirational quality that gets people into to Scotch and um, builds the market for the future. So that's another important function, if you like. And uh, I think it's really important the industry can carry off yeah. that um, you know, high-end single malt and, and the, mainstream. And there's even hope, Richard, in parts of France where uh, I go to the Languedoc every year, where my wife's sister has a share of a house. And when we used to go there at the start, um, the local wines around St. Shinian where you know the kind of stuff you got out of a hose uh, in a big tank, uh, and it was a less than a euro a liter. Um, Languedoc wines are on the up. Uh, I suggest if you haven't tried any of them, you do um, before they get too expensive. But the most of the, the local producers and growers, and they're all cooperatives in all the villages, are really upping their game, coming up with new ways of. Uh, uh, 
uh, maturing the local grapes there, and uh, there are some terrific wines in that whole area. Uh, so much so that the lunch club I go to in Glasgow once a month, the, the young man who chooses the wines uh, is now raving about Languedoc wines in a way that he's never done before. So it, it, there's even salvation for the French in this, this matter of how cheap is the, the drink that you drink. And it helps the French don't tax wine and they do tax, tax spirits quite a lot. So I, I guess so, I would have to say. Um, we're, we're, we've got like two or three minutes now, I think, before we end up. And so I'll take two more questions and quick questions, quick answers. I think I've been a bit unfair and taken people at the edges. So we'll go for a couple at the, the middle, down at the front here, and then, yes, uh, towards the, the back. And then we'll, we'll wrap up. My name is Ian Doig. Um, Alf, I'd be very interested in your views about the European Union dimension of this, looking ahead into internationally Scottish business and the whole Scottish economy. UK seems to be going for a referendum to either stay in or come out. What would the effect of that for Scotland be? Is, is Europe part of the answer or is it part of the problem? Probably for the Scottish dimension of it. Last question at the back there and then... Uh, yeah. Thank you, Al, for your um, comments about the uh, Longodostian uh, wine. I can confirm that living there myself. Uh, how wonderful it's gone. It used to be produced for industrial ethanol uh, primarily, but no more. Anyway, the question I wanted to ask was you mentioned about Brian uh, Wilson's report on and talking about a single portal. Now, uh, this actually, uh, I was involved with the uh, Coal Commission on Exports, which uh, I wrote the report for them. Uh, which were initially commissioned by Ed Balls and Shoko Amuna, and then subsequently went to uh, Sajid Javid and a Francis Maud. And that was one of the ideas. There are a whole variety of ideas, but one of those was precisely about having a single portal, particularly for SMEs, mm. to get them to encourage them yeah. to, uh, you know, in, uh, to export, um, to get over their fears about it. And a, um, <clears throat> this would be largely based upon the kind of... Um, uh, we suggested it, that a possible, just a possible, would be the kind of chambers of commerce on the lines of the, uh, the successful German model of the industry and handles common, who are extremely effective, but not only working in Germany, but also overseas. Mm. You know, so you get things like a trade fair in India where Merkel turns up along with something like 800 uh, German firms, whilst there's about not even one-tenth of that uh, the British firms present in the same thing. So I wonder if the singular portal idea in your idea, you know, in your estimate would either be useful or feasible, or is it just, as you seem to imply, dead? Well, Gosh, we've got two really substantive questions for our last two with, with one minute to go. Um, so Alf, you've got, you got one minute and we can continue over, right. over drinks. I'll take David's first because I've actually forgotten Ian, so he's going to have to prompt me. Hold on, I'll take David's first. Um, uh, Yes, I, I do think it's got great merit, but the tragedy is it's dead because it was uh, commissioned by the Scotland office. It came out uh, in the aftermath of the, the referendum, uh, or even before the referendum, um, and it was going to die for political reasons. Uh, I mean, you cannot have the, the outpost of the... Uh, I'm talking now in... in, in uh, kind of rabid terms that, that, that's going to upset somebody in the room. <laughs> you, you cannot have an outpost of the London government proposing something that they, they then think will be embraced by the government that would be independent. Okay, and the other question, EU in 30 seconds. Oh, EU. Good. EU Good in 30 seconds. Just for, before I came here, I had Robert Peston and Peter Snow discussing this very question in... in Snows, he's got a thing on radio, Time Machine, uh, where he takes somebody to the future and what's happened. And he takes them, because Peston wants to talk about currency, obviously, even now that he's at ITV. Um, so, or even more because he's now at ITV. Uh, so he's taken to the future when there, is, when there is a global currency and it's all mediated by a chip in your brain that's been implanted. So we all just think, you know, uh, uh, I'll, s I'll send David that uh, check for that drink I didn't give him, uh, and, and buying it's in his bank account. Um, but this is pre this presumes that the the euro is uh, no more, and that the European Union is no more. Now I don't I have not a clue 
where the referendum is going to take us. But um, I do think I do think that the European project is in some deep trouble, uh, simply because uh, unless if you're going to try and run a monetary union with such disparate member states uh, in terms of levels of prosperity, in terms of all sorts of measures, it's going to be very... And I, I say this who's, as someone who's got some sympathy for international cooperation beyond uh, the national sovereign will, uh, because I don't see how national sovereign wills are going to solve the big problems of our time. So... I think I think it's in trouble, but I think if you know, I think if we uh, uh, come out of it just in the same way as I argued during the referendum, if we'd come out of the British Union, uh, the single market that we have come, become so used to being disrupted in that way, would have at least in the early stages of the transition huge implications for all of us in terms of our way of life and our uh, functioning of our economy. Uh, I mean, uh, we agree with that. Um, the the EU is in, I think, some quite deep trouble, but we still need it. Uh, we need the free trade area. We need the agreements. We need the single market. And from our point of view as an industry, it's really important that we uh, continue as members. On that note, I'm going to wrap up and just say thanks again to, to Al for an interesting paper, for a great discussion. Thank you to the Royal Society for hosting us. And finally, thank you to the David Hume Institute. And on that note, I'll hand over to, to Ray. Thanks. Uh, thank you, David. It was uh, actually, you stole my lines because I was coming up to, to thank everybody, but thank you, David, also for uh, chairing the discussion. We touched a little bit on um, the new distilleries for the coming uh, into being, and some of them in, in uh, providing employment in very remote areas. I got an email about 18 months ago from a man who said, would I mind commenting on his business plan to set up a distillery on North Uist to serve the Uists? And he attached a letter from David's predecessor at the SWA, which basically said, um, thank you for sending me your a proposal to set up a new distillery. I wish you every success. We at the SWA cannot uh, intervene with uh, to help individual companies, but here are various addresses where you can get advice about starting a business, and when you've got your distillery up and running, come back and see us, and we'll be delighted to welcome you as a member of the SWA. And that was it. So I wrote back saying, yes, I'm very happy to comment on your business plan, and... I heard nothing more. And then six months later, I got an email from him that said, uh, you said you would comment on my business plan, but you haven't replied. And I said, well, I'm waiting for your business plan. And he said, well, that was my business plan. <laughs> so I said, well, I, I had expected a little more than that. I mean, for example, do you have anybody on your team who knows anything about distilling uh, is there anybody that's done any marketing? Is there enough water in North Uist to support a distillery? And he wrote back saying, these are all good points. I'll take them all on board. <laughs> and now, as, as David hinted, we, we, we very much invite you to um, have a drink with us and continue the conversation. I can't guarantee they're Languedoc wines. I can guarantee there'll be no old acrimony served or acrimony of any age. But thank you very much indeed for coming.